Hi guys and welcome to uh, Physics for B. Today is Monday, April 5th. And uh, we're going to, de to do problems from chapter 26. Uh, there is a link on your, uh, on your, uh, on Canvas. Let me find it first of all. It's under unit uh, seven, under models unit seven. Let me type it in here, unit seven. It's entitled chapter 26 problems discussion. This one is actually the first item on that uh, unit. This is problems that we, I did with another uh, uh, section of this class. And that section uh, we discussed basically, I know we did problem 19 and 29 together last time around before we had that break on Wednesday. And uh, I did problems 30, 31 and 32 extensively with that uh, the other section, okay? So what I did in here, I included the discussion that that took place there. It took us an hour and a half basically to do these problems because as you guys know, the way I do this thing is I go very thorough and sometimes I even go way beyond what the questions are asked just to make sure that you have all of the angles are covered. So you are required actually to go through that section and make sure you understand the solution for these problems, problems 30, 31, and 32, okay? Check my work in there to make sure that the calculations are correct and make sure you understand them. I'm going to go briefly with you guys today, let me in, on these problems because we have far more ground to cover in this chapter. So we still have in terms of applications, problem 38, okay, problem 47, problem 60 and problem 74. So as you can see, there are a lot of problems that we need to cover in this chapter. That's why I'm going to go briefly on what I did with the other section. And I'm going to do the same thing with them, by the way, since I already went in detail with these problems with them. So I'm going to have them actually refer to these problems that we're going to be doing more in detail today and have, do them briefly with them and have them actually the, come to the discussion in here. So this is the deal. Today, we ho I hope to cover the rest of the problems from chapter 26 in addition to the problems that are in that link. And then uh, Wednesday, we're going to introduce chapter 27, which is extremely important, but not for this midterm. It's important for the second exam, which is toward the end in the, of April, May and the beginning of April, and also toward the final. So chapter 27, we're going to introduce magnetism with it, and then basically uh, some basic stuff with magnetism and we're going to uh, basically go into our spring break. Also on uh, uh, Wednesday, we have a lab, okay? I also have another recording that I'm gonna post for you guys for the lab, for the one that we, uh, I did with the other section and hopefully you are going to have a benefit from it and we go through the technical. There are so many technical issues with this lab that I want you guys to resolve with the, with the uh, basically uh, the GRE, the Java run, uh, runtime environment that you need to download, okay? So again, that is what's planned this week. Next week is spring break. The week after that, we're going to meet for the exam, for the midterm, okay? When uh, three weeks from uh, today is we're going to resume chapter 27, we do applications with chapter 27 and we continue the, uh, the pace. Still have 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. So we have quite a better material to cover for this class, okay? Again, the deal is there is a recording already in unit seven for you guys to go. And that's the first one, explore in detail and go beyond the questions asked in those three problems. And the problems, as I mentioned in the beginning, are problems. 30, 31, and, 30, and 32. So let me share with you the screen. Okay. 
So let me write down the problems that you need to look at in that recording, and there are problems 30, 31, and 32 from, of course, chapter 26. Okay. So let's talk briefly about these problems, and hopefully you go and get the details from those uh, recordings. So the first problem basically has the following scenario. It gives you a, a, an EMF, a battery of 75 ohms, of oh, 75 ohms, 75 uh, volts, okay? And then connect it to a resistor of 12 ohms. And then there is a junction where you have a resistor in here of 48 ohms. And then uh, in the junction, the other branch of the junction is connected to a battery with an EMF that is not known, okay? And a 15 ohm resistor. And at the end, everything is connected back to itself in here. I'm going to have a switch in here. Probably I have to have two switches, one before this battery and one before the other battery, or after it to disconnect the batteries before we actually turn them on. Okay. The question is, they tell you that uh, after they give you all of that, that there is an ammeter in here. I forgot to write in here. So there is an ammeter, and that ammeter register a current of 1.5 amp in this direction. Okay. And they want you to find the EMF E, this one in here. And they want to make sure to know which way the EMF is pointing. OK. I know the voltage between this point and this point, and it's easy to find from here, OK? So if I call this point A and I call this point B, so I know what VA minus VB is because I can calculate it through this section. Because the same current that goes through the battery this way goes through this resistor of 12 ohms. So the voltage drop between A and B is because I'm going against the current in here is going to be negative 12 times that current. Excuse me. Oh man, I tried to sneeze and it didn't come out. Sorry. Anyway, and then uh, from this point to this point, it's 75 volts. So it's given. So from here, you can find what the voltage difference in there. Knowing what the voltage difference, you can find the current now because this voltage drop, if it is a drop, of course, if this number turned out to be a power greater, and it is, because 75 is more than 12 times negative, uh, times 1.5, more than 18. So you're going to find the voltage drop in here, which should be 57 volts. And this 57 volts is going to give you the voltage. The reason why you need the current in here is for two reasons. Because you're going to come with a current coming through here, and 1.5 goes through this way. So you want to know which way the current, first of all, is going and how much it is. If it is going this one, because this one is greater than 1.5, then this will be pu pushing this way. But if this current turns out to be less than this one, so the current actually needs to be coming this way. Okay? And it turns out to be coming this way. So. From there, you're going to find the voltage drop between A and B now through the other section. Obviously, it's equal to the voltage drop across the EMF, plus if the current is flowing this way, plus, in this case, the voltage drop 15 times this current. So you have an equation. Since you already found what v, uh, a, uh, VA minus VB is through this whole thing that is given to you, you can find it now through this one and find the unknown EM, EMF. If it is positive, that means the polarity is as indicated. If it is negative, the polarity will be flipped. This case is going to be positive. It's going to be greater than zero. So again, you're supposed to do the calculation. And it's actually in that link I provided to you. And it should not be hard to do. So the first calculation that you're going to be doing is VA minus VB, which is equal to minus, because I'm calculating the voltage drop. And I'm going against the current. So it's minus 12 times. 1.5, which is 18, by the way, uh, plus 75, OK? 18 deducted from 75 is what? 57. So this is 57 volts, OK? So that's why I said that this voltage is higher than uh, this voltage. A is higher in potential than B. Then we're going to find the current now between A and B. And that current is the current going through the 48 ohms. 
So what we know is that 57 also is equal to 48 times the unknown current. From here, we're going to find I equals to 57 over 48, okay? This is slightly more than one, but it's less than one and a half amps. So it's somewhere between one, one and one and a half, 57 divided by one and a half, uh, by 48 turned out to be 1.18 or something like that. So it's definitely less than this one. So there must be a current that is coming from this side to compensate for it. And that current is exactly equal to, so the current through the 15 ohms now, I15, would be 1.5 amp because we know that there is a conservation of charge in here. So there is 1.5 coming out is the sum of this two. Therefore, this one must be the difference between the other two, 1.5 minus that number, 57 over 48, okay? So this should give me the current that is running through the 15 ohm. Then I'm going to do the calculation again through this side. So VA v minus VB, which is 57 volts, by the way, 57 volts must be equal to the EMF that I don't know, because that's a voltage drop actually, because I'm going against it this way. So it's the EMF plus the current that is running through the 15 ohms times 15. So it's gonna be 15 times 1.5 minus 57 over 48. If I do the calculation, this number will turn out to be positive and the polarity is as indicated, okay? Except that there is an issue here and that is it seems like the current through this one is coming from the positive end and going through this way, that is fine. So this battery is behaving properly. This current, since it turns out to be pointing this way, it seems like it's coming from positive to the negative against the battery. And that is fine. The reason why, because this EMF will turn out to be less than this one. So this EMF is far more bigger and it's going to push the current not only on this side, but it's going to push it against this battery too. And that is basically what this problem is, problem 30, okay? I know I'm going to go brief on this problem, but I'm hoping that you guys go, will go and check on that link and do the calculations again in detail to make sure that you have no, you don't miss any point in here, okay? And because I'm telling you that, because these problems and all of the problems from chapter 26 are extremely important for your preparation for the exam. So think of this one as an exam review, actually, too. Okay, problem 31. For problem 31, what they have in here, they have, again, a, a battery in EMF of 25 volt. And we have a resistor of 100 ohms. Okay, we have a junction in here and all we have in the junction is a switch. And the switch is S and we have actually an M meter. And we have another junction where we actually have, I'm sorry, I have it backwards. We have an EMF that is pointing this way of 15 volt, we have a battery near 15 volt, plus we have a resistor of 75 ohms, and uh, we have it in here in between a voltmeter. So this is just a voltmeter measuring the voltage across this whole points in here. And this whole thing is connected this way. So this is problem 31, by the way, okay? So in this problem, this is what they said in here. So uh, they said in the circuit shown, all meters are idealized. That means that the, uh, the resistance in here is infinite. That's what means it's an idealized voltmeter. And the resistance in here is equal to zero. That's what it means to be an idealized M meter, okay? So they work against, uh, I mean, opposite to one another. And the batteries have no internal resistance. So they are just ideal also batteries. Uh, find the reading of the voltmeter with the switch S open. S open, okay? Which is at a higher potential, A or B. So we want to know the reading in the voltmeter in here, okay? VA minus VB, basically. If VA minus VB is positive, that means it's uh, A is a higher potential than B. 
and otherwise it's less. Again, we have an, uh, we're going to, this is open. So there is no current that is going to flow through an open circuit at this point. So the current is going to leave the 100 meter. So there is a voltage drop in here this way. And in here, I'm going to go from the negative to the positive. So it's going to be a voltage rise by 15 volts. So if I'm keeping track of, of the drop only, the drop, not the rise, I'm going to have 100 I minus 15, because I'm going from, I'm rising by 15, so I'm dropping by negative 15. Plus, this is, has a resistance of infinity, so the current is not going to go through that one. It's going to go straight through this. Plus 75 times the same current I. So that's what I'm saying in here. This current I will come straight in here because nothing will go through this side because there is an infinite resistance in here. Okay. Plus uh, 75 times the same I. And we go back to this point in here. And again, we're coming from the negative to the positive. So we're rising by, uh, uh, by uh, 25. So we're dropping by negative 25. So you solve this equation for I, you're going to find how much I is. So I is going to be 40 over 175 uh, amps. Okay. Now you have the I. So you need to find this voltage drop between A and B. You have two ways of doing it, and both of them should give you the same answer. So VA minus VB is either a straight down this way, which is negative 15 plus 75 times I negative 15 plus 75 times i, which is 40 over 175. So this should give me an answer now, OK? 75 times, I forgot the number, if it turns out to be positive or negative. I really don't remember the, uh, the numbers. So let me do it quickly in here in my calculator. So negative 15 plus. Uh, 75 times 40 over 175. It turns out to be a positive number. So this is positive 2.14 volts. OK, that's correct. Now, so that means A is higher than B by this much, 2.14 volt. Now, how about if I calculate it from the other side? That should be the same answer. So if I go from the other side, I'm actually going against the current. So I'm going negative 100 times I, and I is this number. So this should be the same thing as negative 100 times i, and i is 40 over 175 plus now, because I'm coming from positive to a negative, it's plus 25. The reason why I had it minus earlier is because of minus going from minus to positive. So that's a, actually a rise by 15 uh, ohm, uh, by 15 volt, which means a negative drop. Now I'm actually dropping by 25 because I'm going from positive to negative. So it's going to be a drop of 25 volts. And if I do the calculation in here, it should give me identically the same number. This should also give me 2.14 volts. Because it doesn't matter which way you calculate this voltage drop, whether you go straight down like this or just like that. And that is exactly the reading of the voltmeter. That is what the voltmeter will read. OK? So the question was, again, if the switch is, uh, which is the higher point? So A is going to be a higher point than B by this much, by 2.14 volts. Now, with switch S closed, now they close the switch. Find the reading of the voltmeter and the ammeter. Ammeter is going to read zero when you close this switch. The reason why it's going to be zero is because there is no resistance in here. So whatever that voltage drop between A and B is going to be a resistance uh, of zero. Sorry, what am I saying in here? Yeah, so in this case, the voltage drop is zero. I'm sorry, the voltage drop is zero. VA minus VB is zero, not the current. I'm sorry about that, OK? So VA minus VB is zero, because the resistance is zero times whatever current is going to be zero. So VA minus VB is zero. Yes, you have convenience of calculating it now this way, calculating it that way, calculating it that way. But the easiest one is through the short, you short circuited it in here by closing the circuit. So the, 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 uh, the voltage is going to be zero. So the voltmeter is going to be reading zero now because VA and VB are exactly the same potential now, because they have the same, they're connected via a wire. And now, so we know, but we want to find the reading of the M meter. For that, we have to take into two, two things in here. So we have a current that is being pushed by this in this way, 
and we have another current that is pushed this way by the other battery. And these two are clearly not in the same direction. So this is I through 100, and this is the I through 75. Okay? So the I through 75 will go from BA, which is zero, drop by, I mean, uh, rise by 15, and drop by 75 times, uh, I, I 75 times 75. And this will give me an equation when I come back to the same point in here of basically uh, uh, the current I is equal to, what is it? 15 divided by 75. So I'm gonna find the current in here that is gonna be basically 15 divided by 75. Going up. This current coming down on the opposite direction is again, 25 divided by 100. 25 to 100 is just 0.25 amp. Okay, and 15 divided by 75 is if I multiply this one by four, 75, 15 divided by 75 is what? 0.2 amp. So 0.2 amp is pointing up, 0.25 amp is coming down. So the net current in this section is going to be 0.05 amp. It is going to be coming down. So then the, the ammeter, that's how much current is going to read in here, okay? And it's pointing down, so that's the question. Which way up or down does the current flow in the switch so it's going to be going down? So this is in a nutshell problem 31. Problem 32, which is really the opposite of problem 30. So you have to really pay attention to this kind of problems. So problem 32 says that in the circuit shown, so they have an EMF that they don't know its value. So we have a battery in here with an EMF unknown connected to a 17 ohm resistor. And then we have a junction in here. And in this junction, we have a six ohm resistor followed by 25 ohm, 25 volt battery followed by three ohm resistor. And here we have a junction where we have 20 ohms and 20 ohms. And then after that, we have a 19 ohm resistor followed by an M meter A. And then we have one, M, one ohm resistor, and then the junction in here of these two branches, and there is actually third branch in here where we have actually 13 ohm resistor. So this is 13 ohms. Okay, they tell you that they know the resistor of six ohms, that resistor in the middle in here, has a current flowing through it so that there is a power that is being dissipated of 24 watts, basically. 24 joules per uh, per second. So that is the power there. So, and they know the current, the direction of the current is pointing up, which means that this current in here is also pointing up. And it's the same current because this entire thing is just one branch. So the current through it by conservation of charge is the same thing. So when the current it flows through it as shown, find the current through the emitter. So we need to find this current through the emitter here. So first of all, we need to find this current. This current, we can find it because, why do we need to find this current? Because I want to find this vo voltage drop between A and B. Once I find this voltage drop between A and B, it's the same voltage drop between this section, okay? So that's gonna be, this current is needed because I know this voltage drop is 15 uh, to uh, 25 volts, but I need to find this voltage drops between the six ohms and the three, uh, three, uh, three ohms. Since I know the, uh, the power in there, I can find the, uh, the current, the power, which is 24 uh, watts, that's what the power is, is equal to the resistor times the current squared. From here, I is going to be equal to the square root of 26 divided by, R is six ohms, by the way, divided by six, 24 divided by six. And 24 divided by six is square root of four, which is two amps. So there is a two amp current that is flowing this way. So from here, I can find what that voltage drop between A and B. Voltage drop between A and B is going to be VAB, which is VA minus VB, is going to be, again, I'm going against the current. So I'm actually rising a potential by 
two amps times six ohms. So it's gonna be negative two times six Ri, six times two, I should say. Plus, I'm actually dropping, I'm coming from the positive section of this battery to the negative side. So I'm actually dropping by 25 volts, plus 25 volts. And then I'm going against the current again in here. So I'm actually rising. So I'm dropping by a negative number of three times two, negative three times two. So the voltage drop in here, you have two times six, which is 12 and two times three, that's six. So it's a negative 18 plus 25. And the answer is seven volts. So there is a seven volt drop between A and B. So A is actually higher than B2 in this case. And this is equal to this circuit in here. And this circuit, I have an R equivalent, that's all in here. I don't have, this has an R equal to zero. That's an idealized ammeter. So unless otherwise told, it's an idealized ammeter. This two, they can be replaced by their equivalent resistor, which is one over 20 plus one over 20 inverted. So one over 20 plus one over 20 is actually one over 10 because the common denominator is two, uh, 20 and then two, uh, one plus one is two, two cancels is two. So this one is inverted, so it becomes just 10 ohms. So these two are actually just the equivalent of a 10 ohm resistor, that's all. 10 ohms plus 19 plus one, that is 30 ohms. So the 30 ohms is actually the resistor, the voltage drop between A and B still. So the voltage drop between A and B, which is seven volts, is also equal to 30 ohms times the current flowing through whatever you want to call it, 19, because we have a 19 ohms in here. Okay, so this is 19 ohms. So that gives me that current, and that is exactly what the ammeter is going to be reading. So the ammeter is going to be reading uh, 7 over 30 amps. Okay, so that is the voltage that uh, that is the current that is going to be read by this ammeter. Now, uh, what are the polarity and EMF of the unknown battery, assuming it has negligible internal uh, resistance? Okay. So we need to go through this side. Now let's tally the currents because it's critical to find out what's the story of the current. The current two amps is coming in here. We found it from the previous step. And this current that we found is seven over 30 amp. Obviously the two amp is going this way, only seven over 30, which is less than one is going this way. So in here is just the difference of 22, I'm sorry, two amps minus this seven over 30 amp, okay? which is what, 60 minus seven, which is 53 divided by 30. So it's some number, one point something, one point something amp, but it's moving this way. So if I go from VA to VB, I'm going in the same direction of the current. So this is an actual voltage drop in here, plus a voltage drop of an EMF in here, which is E, plus in this case, I'm moving in this direction. So that's another voltage drop must be equal to seven volt. So here is the deal. From VA to VB again, which is seven volt. I'm dropping with the current in here with this current, which is two minus seven over 30, 30 times 17, 17 times that number. I didn't do the algebra. I'm relying on you that you're gonna do the algebra. Plus another voltage drop through the EMF because it's actually a voltage drop. If the polarity is correct, if the polarity is flipped, that number needs to be a rise, not a drop. So I'm coming from the positive to the negative according to this diagram, so therefore it's a drop. And I'm going again with the current, so that's actually another drop of 13 times two minus seven over 30. Okay, 13 plus 17, that is actually 30. And this must be equal to then 30 because it's the same current times two minus seven over 30 and plus the EMF E, okay. This number is actually 60 minus seven. 60 minus seven is 53 volts, is equal to seven volt plus the EMF in here. Obviously the EMF is gonna be negative because 50 uh, is gonna be seven minus 53. So it's gonna be a negative 48 volt. That's what the EMF is. So that means that it was actually all along a rise in potential, not a drop. So the polarity is incorrect. So the polarity should really go like this by 48 volts, okay? So th the next question is asking you about the polarity because I found it to be negative if I chose it in that direction and it's negative 48 volts. So the value is 48 volts, but the polarity needs to be switched, okay? 
For more details, please watch the recording on section on unit seven from this chapter. And we went through a lot detail, more detail than this probably what 20 minutes or so uh, version of it. Does this make sense to you guys, at least the summary of it so that we can move along? Because we have quite a few things to do. Okay, very good. So the next problems. Let's jump into problem uh, 38. That's the other problem that I'm going to Problem 38, okay? So in problem 38, you said you can, uh, that says you connect a battery, a resistor and capacitor as shown in figure 2660. Uh, so basically you have a battery in here. I'm sorry, why do I have to write this way? Battery here, you have a resistor and you have a, capacitor, okay, and, uh, and there is a switch somewhere, which I'm not going to draw, but hopefully you guys understand practically you need the switch, okay, and the EMF is 36 volts, and the resistor, uh, the capacitor is 5 microfarad, please when you do this lab, you have to be very, labs, you have to be very careful with the, with the, with the capacitors, it's usually of the order of a micro, nano, picofarads, or even less than that, but don't get me a number that has 10 to the power 13 or 10 to the power 10 farads, that is nonsense, you should really realize that, that you cannot have, especially in exams, don't, don't, you have to be critical of your own work, once you find a solution, R, yes, R can be small or big, okay, but Capacitance that is of an order of a farad is a huge capacitor. It's actually physically big capacitor. Okay. So R is 100 ohms. So let alone 1 to the 10 to the power 10 or something like that. That doesn't make sense. I was grading the labs and I was, saw that and I was really, uh, it's really not good. Anyway, so the switch S is closed at equal to 0. So there was a switch all along. Okay, so there was a switch in here at t equal to zero. We close the switch, okay? When the voltage across the capacitor is eight volt, so at that point, so there was no charge in the capacitor, no charge in the capacitor. So uh, when the voltage across the capacitor is eight volt, what is the magnitude of the current in the circuit? So here is the deal. At some time t in the future, Okay, this voltage initially was zero, VC. But let's, let's label things. Let's call this one A, this one B, this one C, and this one D, okay? No, actually C and D are the same points. All of this is just a point C, okay? There is no point of right extra points in there. So we have A, B, and C that separates all of our components because the switch has zero resistor. Okay, so, Initially, there was no voltage, but then after building up a charge over time, there will be a voltage that is usually Q over C, okay? So uh, at some point, VB, C, which is VB minus VC, is equal to 8 volt. So the question is, what is the current that is running through the circuit, I? So at that instance, it's easy to do. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use Kirchhoff's rule again, coming from any point and coming back to it and saying that that's equal to zero. So VA, A, which is zero, which is VA minus VA, is the same thing as VA minus VB plus VB minus VC plus VC minus VB. VA, I'm sorry, okay? So I closed my circuit in here. So I came back to my starting point, okay? From A to B, I'm with the direction of the current. So that is actually RI. That is the voltage drop, RI. From VB to VC, that is eight volt. They gave us that. Okay, from VC to uh, VA, I'm actually going from the negative to a positive, so I'm arising the potential, therefore I'm dropping by negative 36. This must be zero because my starting point is my ending point. 36 minus eight, that is gonna be 28 volt. So RI is 25 volts, so it's gonna be RI 
is going to be 28 volts. And that means I is equal to 28 volt over R and R is equal to, according to my information here, 120 ohms. So it's 28 divided by 120 ohms. And that is going to be 28 divided by 120 ohms. Please check my numbers, OK? It's 0 0.23 repeating. How many sig figs in this problem? We have three sig figs, so 0 0.233 amps. OK? So this is, I hope that you guys uh, understand the point in here of how to find this current because it's just regular uh, regular circuit now. Because I know the voltage drop across the cap capacitor. I know the voltage across the, this one in here so I can find the voltage across the resistor. And that is actually by Ohm's law, R times I. From there, we're going to find I, which is just the voltage drop divided by R. So in this case, it's just basically the difference between 20, 36 volt, and in here it's eight volt, okay? Does this make sense? How to find the current? Okay, very good. So that is the current through the entire circuit, by the way. That's not just through the resistor. It's because it's going to come in here. That is the rate at which we're building up charges at this point on the capacitor. And it's going to go. That is what we're draining from the battery, if you wish, the current that the number of charges that we're removing from the battery every second at this rate. This is how many coulombs per second are being coming out of the battery. Now, at what time t after the switch is closed is the voltage across the capacitor 8 volt? OK. We have two ways of tackling this issue. One way is through the current. The current i, if you remember the theory, it says epsilon over r exponential of minus t over rc, where rc is tau. For my case in here, R is 120 ohms. And C, the capacitance is 5 microfarads. So tau in my circuit is equal to 5 times 120 is what? 5 times, is it 600? Yeah, it's 600 microseconds or 0 0.6 milliseconds. You have to be very careful in here with this time scale. It's a very small number, OK? 0 0.6 milliseconds, or 6 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds, OK? So that's how much tau it is. Initially, i is equal to epsilon over r. So i naught in the beginning is epsilon over r. And epsilon is uh, uh, 36 volt divided by 120 ohms. And that is equal to 0.3. So initially, it's 0.3 amps. And after I wait, so initially, it was charging 0.3 amps. And then after I wait a certain amount of time, the rate drops to 0.23 amps. It's going to go to zero ultimately. This is the graph we're looking at. It's this, it's uh, charging of a capacitor with the current, OK? So in this case, I starts at epsilon over R and starts to drop exponentially, OK? So we're here somewhere in the graph. We are at this time t, which we need to find, OK? So the current was 0.3 amp. Now it's down 0.233 amps, OK? So that's basically what this graph is. So this is time, and this is the current i as a function of time. Okay. So uh, we need to find what this. It's very easy to do in this case. So all we have to do is assume that t is equal at t equal to t one. Uh, the current i is actually equal to. I'm going to use the uh, the actual expression, which was 28 over 120. So that before we do any rounding, so it's 28 over 120. And it was given by the formula 36 over 120 exponential of minus t over tau. I'm going to leave it in terms of tau. I know tau is 600 microseconds. So the reason why I do it this way so that you can cancel that 120, and I will be left with uh, 28 over 36 
is equal to the exponential of minus t over tau. Take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of both sides. So it's going to be ln of 28 over 36 is going to be equal to negative t over tau. T1, that is, because I'm assuming that T1 is when this thing is. So I want to find what T1 is. So that means T1 is equal to negative tau times the natural log of 28 over 36. There is a property for the natural log. Ln of uh, A over B is the same thing as negative Ln of B over A. Because I have a negative in here, I need to get rid of it. Because this ratio is negative. I mean, the ln is negative because this ratio is less than one. But if I flip the order in there, it's going to be positive. So the time needs to be positive. So we cannot find time in the future, in the past, I'm sorry. So the time must be in the future. Tau time ln of 36 over 28. So you have to be very careful in here when you're calculating time because you started charging. And at that time, the current is at max 0.3 amps. So if you now figure out that the, 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 the current is less than 0.3 amps, the rate at which you're building charge now is less because there is more and more charge in the capacitor. So it's not allowing more and more charges. Therefore, the time must be in the future. It cannot have, uh, have happened in the past. So T needed to be positive in this case, okay? So you have to be very careful in here. So the reason why I flipped the order in here is because the ln of A over B is equal to negative of the ln of B over A. This is a property of the natural log and that's basically how we're going to get this expression. It just has to do with the ratio of the exponentials, that's all. So, tau is 600. I'm gonna leave things in the microseconds, okay? Times ln, open parentheses, of 36 over 28. I'm using a calculator in here. Hopefully you guys have to, you have that too. So it's 100 and 51 microseconds. So what does that mean? Okay. Which is less than, uh, what is the ratio of ln again? ln of 36 over 28. I need to know how big is the, this is a quarter tau. Tau itself is 600 seconds. So tau, tau is somewhere in here. This is a quarter tau. After a quarter tau, the current drops from 0 0.3 to 0 0.233. So that's what that means. After 151 mi microseconds, the current drops by, by this one. And initially, you had no charge in the capacitor. You had no voltage in the capacitor. And the voltage is already, by then, 8 volts. Okay, And after a while, it's going to be exactly 36 volts, where the current dies out completely at that point. Okay, So this is building up a charge in the capacitor. So this is the time. If you care to write it in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 0.151 milliseconds, or if you want to write it in, uh, what do you call it? Decimal representation is 1.51 times, scientific representation, I should say, 1.51 times 10 to the negative four seconds, okay? Which is really, really short time, okay? So when the voltage across the, at what rate is the energy being stored in the capacitor? Okay, we need to find Q, okay? Sorry, the energy that is stored in the capacitor, that is actually coming from the resistor, from the, uh, the, the battery, okay? Okay, so here is the deal. The energy E, I mean U, in the capacitor is equal to Q squared over 2C. So that means the power of putting this charge in the capacitor is going to be du over dt. That's all. Okay. And if I take the derivative of this expression, it's going to be Q over C times dQ over dt. This is the voltage across the capacitor. That is 8 volt. And this is the current, I. So the power at which we're putting this one, it's 8 volt times that current of 0.233 amps. That's all, 0.233 amps. Or if you wish, amps. Or if you wish, 8 times, how much is the expression? Something over 120. 
28 over 120, yeah. So that's the current. So 28 over 120, and that's gonna give me the power in watts actually, eight times 28 divided by 120. Let me let me go through. So it's 1.87 watts. Let me explain what this point is. They want to know the rate at which energy is being stored in the capacitor because we are storing energy when we charge a capacitor. This is the energy that is stored at this point in the process. We're not at the final stage yet where it's fully charged. We are somewhere, actually we are a little over about quarter tau, okay? Quarter of this time. We're supposed to wait an infinite amount of time, by the way. We just waited 151 milliseconds. We waited only 151 milliseconds or 1.51 uh, times 10 to the negative four seconds. This is how much charge we have so far, which we don't know and we don't care at this point. If you care to find it, it's easy. All you have to do is basically say, okay, eight volt is Q over C. You know what C is, so you can find Q, which is C, C times Q, uh, C times V, and uh, that is C is five microfarads times eight volts. Eight times five is 40, so it's 40 microcoulombs. That's how much charge you have right now, okay? At this point, which is 151 uh, microseconds immediately after you turn on the switch. So this is how much charge you have in here, but they don't ask for that. They are asking for the rate at which you now you're putting that charge. You're putting more and more charges. I mean, uh, the, the, the power basically. Not the rate of the, the rate is actually the current. I'm sorry, I'm getting stuff in here mixed up. So the, how much, how are you, how much energy, the rate at which you're putting energy actually, this is the energy at this point. So you're curious trying to find how much energy it should be at this point in the process, U in the capacitor is just Q squared over two C and Q squared, I just found it to be 40 micro Coulomb squared divided by two times capacitor, which is two times five. So this is, Four times four is 16, 1600, 1600 divided by two times five, which is 10. And then uh, the micro joules. One of the micros will cancel this micro and you will be left with another micro up there of Coulomb squared per farad, and that's gonna be joule. So 1600 divided by 10, it's 160 micro joules. This is how much energy we have right now. We're building more. We're putting more energy in the capacitor. That's the whole purpose of it, okay? But at this time, after 151 milliseconds, microseconds, I'm sorry, after 151 microseconds, this is how much energy we have in the capacitor, 160 microjoules already. And uh, the charge that we have there is 40 microcoulombs. But they want to know the rate where, where, with which we're putting that energy into the capacitor the rate, so if you wait a second later, it's gonna be more energy or a fraction of a second later is gonna be more energy. So the power basically in this case is the derivative of the energy. That is basically what the power is, the rate at which energy is changing, du over dt in the capacitor, of course. If you take the derivative of two Q squared, I mean Q squared, you drop the two and that's why I canceled the two from the numerator, so it's Q over C, times dq over dt. And q over c is actually the voltage, which is eight volt that's given. And the current I, we calculated it to be 0.23 amps. Okay, although I use the full expression in here to get me a, probably a, I don't know if I did the 0.233 times eight. It should be the same number. It should be 1.87. I mean, if you have access to the full express, it's giving me 1.867, 8, 8, 1.864, okay? Whereas if I use the full-fledged number of a 28 of 120, that gives me 1.867. Listen, if you have an exam and you're using a, a rounded number in your calculation, you're gonna be off slightly, okay? But that's fine, okay? I can, I can I, if, if you show your work, I can trace back where 
you're where you basically rounded and where you where you want so you you will get full credit that at that point you don't lose anything okay it's usually when you don't show me your work and it's completely went south in the sense that the the the, the error went completely big at that point and the divergence is untraceable it becomes hard for me to give you credit for something that i don't see so that's why it's very important that you show your credit if i if i do this calculation here this is how much it's saying 0.18 i'm sorry 1.1.866 uh, and 4 so rounding just to 6 whereas i said that if i use the full expression like i did in here it's 1.87 okay 1.866666 so it's rounded up to 1.87 okay so uh, again if you are showing your work and your solutions, it gives me a chance to give you credit where you're supposed to, or even if you lose points, you lose them in some points, but you don't lose them everywhere because the rest of the argument is correct. Had you gotten it correct in here and I follow you, now you made a mistake in this stage because there was an error in here. So you already been penalized for making a mistake in there, but all of the steps are correct. So in this case, you should get credit for this amount of work. Actually, a lot of credit, if not the full credit for it, because you already lost points in here. But if you don't show me your work, there is no way for me. You're going to lose points in here because you got it wrong. You're going to lose points in here because you got it wrong. And you're going to lose points somewhere else. An error that has probably propagated and get you into so many other errors could have been easily getting you more credit for it. Does this make sense for you guys? Here is one item in here. In addition to checking the work, because we're doing a problem session, is show your work. You must show your work. That is the item that I want you guys to remember from this discussion that I'm just having with you guys. Does this make sense to you guys, how important that is? Yes? Very good. Okay, so you guys need to show your work so that to help me make sure, and it helps you also when you go through your 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 your, your analysis. You know exactly where what you did and what you didn't do. So don't just basically throw in answers in that that can kind of coming out of basically thin air. Okay. Anyway, so this is a problem now. Uh, 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 Thirty-eight. Okay. We still have a few more. So this is the item that I want you guys to uh, to have in uh, the discussion today, so that you're uh, you're fully covered in terms of the exams and everything else. Problem forty-seven. Is this problem clear, first of all, or not? You guys understand it. I know I went far more than what the questions was asking, but I'm hoping that here is a check with this problem. That's really why I did this problem. Is this natural log in here to find this time? Okay, because that's how you find the time. Because we were dealing with a current all along, and we use this expression for the current. This is from the lecture. Okay, so because we know the current in the beginning, so we want to find. And we know the current now, so we use this expression to find what the time is when this condition happens. So we take the natural log of both sides. Okay, so this is problem thirty-eight. Problem forty-seven. Problem 47 is actually has a, an idea that I really want you to also to go through. It looks awful. It looks complicated. Okay. So let me graph this thing to you guys. So we have a battery in here of how much? 100 volts. As shown, we have a junction in here. In this junction, we have a capacitor and a resistor. The resistor is 25 ohms. And the capacitor is 15 microfarads. And then we have another resistor of 75 ohms. And a junction. In this junction, basically what we have, we have a 20 microfarad capacitor and a resistor of 5 ohm, 50 ohms. OK. And then in this junction, we have another junction actually, where we have 25 ohm, 25 ohm, not two ohms. And then we have a capacitor of 10 microfarads. 
And then this junction is comes back in here that is actually in series with a 25 ohm resistor. And these two are actually in a junction by themselves. And now we have a 15 ohm resistor. That's 15. And finally, we have an M meter in here. And we're closing the circuit. Looks kind of complicated, doesn't it? So let's see if we can do things that are easy on this problem. So it says the capacitors are initially in charge. So there was no charge in the capacitors. The battery has no internal resistance and the emitter is ideal. Everything is basically ideal in here. Find the emitter reading A immediately just after the switch is closed. So there was a switch in here I didn't show, I'm sorry. Okay. So you close the switch and immediately thereafter find the reading in the emitter. Okay. So that's part A. So the circuit now looks like this. Immediately thereafter, this is what's happened. This is, there is no voltage drop in here. It behaves just like a wire, remember from the lecture. So this is short circuited as if it's not there at all. It's because short circuited, all the current that comes in here will go through this one. Nothing goes through the 25 ohms because in here the path of least resistance is with an R equal to zero. And then when it comes to this point again, it's short circuited. There is no, uh, this behaves like an, an, a resistance of zero. And again, this resistor of 25 ohms, it's not there at all because this is short circuited. So this is how the current will come in here. It's gonna split itself between this 50 ohms and this 25 ohms. It looks like the 50 and the 25 are actually in parallel to one another. So the 25 and the 50 are equivalent to just one big resistor, which is one over 25 plus one over 50. And the common denominator to the negative power one, by the way, and the common denominator is 50. So it's two over 50 plus one over 50. So this is equivalent to the negative one. So this is equivalent to 50 over three ohm. So I only, as if I only have 50 over three ohm plus 15 ohm plus nothing in here plus 75 ohms in here, okay? Because I replaced these two by their equivalent. So this is how much current in here. So what I have in here, if I apply Ohm's law, I will have uh, negative 100 volt plus this resistance of 75 plus this equivalent resistance now between these two, which is 50 over three ohms. plus this 15 ohms times the current I is equal to zero. From here, I'm going to find the current to be 100 over this sum. 50, uh, 15 plus 75, that's 80, plus 50 over three. And that should give me the current that is going to be read by the emitter, which is 100 over open parentheses, 80 plus 50 over three and close the parentheses. So it's 1.03 amps. That's how much current is flowing through the circuit, okay? This resistor of 25 ohms and this resistor of 25 ohms have been short circuited immediately by this capacitor and that capacitor. So they don't enter into the equation whatsoever, okay? So this part A, it's a lot simpler when you think about it this way, instead of reading all of this complicated stuff. Part B, after the S has been closed for a very long time, when it's very long time, it's the opposite. This will be open now. There is the current that comes in here will flow through the 25 ohms and come here. So there will be no current that is going to go through this capacitor. This will be open also. So there is no current that is going to go through this section at all. So the 50 ohms will be out of commission. So this is not gonna be in. And now this also is going to be open. So no current is going to go through this way at all. So all the current that has come from the 75 ohms, it goes first of all through the 25, goes through the 75. It's gonna come through the 25 now, this 25 now that becomes part of the play, plus this 25. And now it goes straight through the 15 and that's it. So now the part B is actually the other part, the other way around. After we, it's fully charged, it's not gonna take any more current because it's fully charged. 
So it's going to act as if it's open circuit. No more charges going through there. So all the charges have to go through the 25. So again, I do uh, Ohm's law. I mean, uh, Kirchhoff's rule, negative 100 volts plus. I'm going to go through the 25 ohms plus the 75. Plus, we cannot go through here because there is, an, uh, there is a capacitor that is fully charged. We wait too long. So now this will be uh, uh, an open circuit. So we're going to come in here. We cannot go through there either. So we're going to come through the 25 plus 25. That's 50. So plus 25 plus 25. Plus the last one that is sitting in here is 15 ohms. Is this 15? Yeah, 15 ohms. The whole thing times the new i. So this is i naught. This is in the beginning. And this is i infinity is equal to 0. From here, we're going to find the, uh, the current after an infinite amount of time. We wait for it. It's going to be 100 divided by 25 plus 75 plus 25 plus 25 plus 15. So this is going to be equal to, again, I'm going to actually do it is. this. I don't want to do any mental math right now because I don't feel like I can do it. 25 plus 75 plus 25 plus 25 plus 15. So it's just easier this way to find what I went wrong. OK, so the current in here is 0 0.606 amps. Well, there are two points for this problem, two extremely important points for this problem. First of all, the fact that how to treat capacitor immediately after the switch is open or closed, and then when you wait a long time after it has been closed. The first time, you're going to treat it as a wire, as if you short-circuited this resistor. So there is no current going through it whatsoever. Same thing is happening for this resistor. And this one, all of the current goes through this 50 ohms. Now, when you wait too long, then they become open circuit, in a sense that, in this case, nothing flows through them. So everything will go through everything else except them. Like in this case, current tries to go through this capacitor, but no, it's fully charged. So the, there is no current going through the 50 ohms either. So all the current comes in here, and then it's not going to go through this 10 microfarads either because it's fully charged. So all the current will go through here. And that is how you find the current in this way. So that is one point. The second point that I want to make is the fact that, and like what we did before, which is charging a capacitor where the current starts from a finite value and drops to zero. In this case, it drops from a finite value, and this is how much it is and does not drop to zero because there is other ways for the current to still make it to the, uh, to, uh, through the, uh, so it drops to a finite value of 0 0.606 amps. So initially we were charging the capacitors and the law really, if we solve this equation in time is gonna be a little bit more complicated, but does not give me that same nice exponential feature that I had before. It's gonna be a complicated function of time. It starts from this value and then starts to drop, drop, drop. It does not go completely zero because there is still another path for the current to continue uh, uh, circulating in this circuit even after an infinite amount of time. Okay, so this is the point that I wanted to make from problem 47. Does this problem make sense to you guys on how to treat it? Okay, very good. So we still have two more problems at least to cover it now. And those are problem uh, 60 and uh, 74. I want to jump right to problem 74 because it has a practical problem. I mean, it's used, it's, it's used in the lab extensively. So problem 74. Problem 74 is a uh, Whitstone bridge. So what you have in this case, you have a, uh, let me draw it. You have a battery with an EMF E. And you have a junction in here, A, where you have a resistor N and another resistor P. And you have another junction in here, which is B and C. In B and C, what you have, you have another switch and you have a galvanometer. Galvanometer is just like an ammeter, except it measures currents of extreme small quantities. So it's usually of the microamps. 
So that's what the galvanometer is. And you would want one in here because you would want the current to be actually zero. You don't want it even to be a finite value. So if you're using a regular ammeter, it might give you a reading of zero, but there is actually current still flowing through this. So this is for high precision equipment. You need to use a galvanometer instead of an ammeter. So in here, you have a resistor that is called X. So this point is C, by the way, this point is B, X. And then they meet back again with another resistor in here, M. And then we have another switch in here, S1. And this is S2. And we have closed the circuit in there. Here is what you do with this kind of circuit. You close the two switches. And you tinker, because you don't know resistance x, you would want to find x. So that is basically what your problem is. So, and you know the values of m and p and n, OK? You play with one of them or two of them or the combination of the three of them so that there is no current after you close the switches. So S2 is closed, and S1 also is closed. Both of them are closed. So after you close them both, you don't want to see any reading in the galvanometer. You want to see zero current going through it. That means the voltage drop between B and C, VBC, which is VB minus VA, VC, must be equal to a zero current times whatever that finite resistance in the wires is, albeit it's a very small quantity. So this is zero. That means the points B and the points C have reached equilibrium. They are balanced. In this case, you have played around with your resistors so that in this case, the two points have the same potential. They're at the same height. So that is the condition for the, the bridge in this case, OK? So this is the condition. So you'd want to achieve that by making sure that the galvanometer is zero. So we're monitoring the galvanometer and playing with the values of M, N, and P. So from here, you're asked to show this condition is met that x, the unknown uh, uh, resistor, is just the product of m times p divided by n. OK? So that's what we're supposed to show. Well, it's uh, since the voltage drop is 0, so I'm going to say in here the voltage drop between these two points is 0, so they are at the same potential. So there are two ways of handling this one in here. I can go through from A back to A, going through this current in here, which I'm going to call I1. And this current is going to be I2. Okay, So this current I1 is going to flow here. And there is no current going through this one or coming through it. So there is a current that is I equal to 0 here. So the entire I1 must be going through this branch because there is no current. The galvanometer is reading, reading no current at this point. Same thing with I2. When it comes in here, Nothing will go or come from this side, so the I current is zero, so all of I2 will go through here. So if I do that, that means this is how this circuit looks like. VA minus VA is equal to zero, obviously. And uh, from one side, or VA minus V, what did we call this point? D? This is D. Okay. VA minus VD is the following VA minus VD is the following. On one side, it's equal to the EMF, because there is a voltage drop with epsilon. On the other side, it's n times I1 plus m times I1, I1, which is n plus m times I1. And this also is equal to, on this side, p times I2 plus x times I2. Because, again, these two currents must be the same since there is no current flowing through this galvanometer. That is the condition of, the, of balance. So in this case, it's going to be P plus X times I2. Now, since these two potentials are the, the same, so what I'm going to do in here, I'm calculating, I'm going to calculate VB minus v, uh, VA. VB minus VA. which is the same thing as VC minus VA. The reason why I'm saying that is because VC is equal to VB. VB is equal to VC. So if I subtract from this equation because there is no current flowing through it, that means VB is equal to VC. That's basically what this means. 
So if I subtract VA from here and I subtract VA from here, it's the same thing. So that is what this expression is. VB minus VA, it's just N times I1, according to Ohm's law. The voltage drop across this point in here is just this resistor times this current. So it's NI1. And VC minus VA, it's the same thing. It's P times I2. It's P I2. So here is what I have. I have equation one and I have equation two and both of them involve I1 and I2. So I'm gonna find I2 in terms of I1 using this equation, which is I2, or actually you can divide these two equations side by side. Divide one by two. If I divide equation one by two, I1 and I1 cancel and I2 and I2 cancel because I don't know what they are and I really don't care what they are. That's the whole point of the whole exercise in here. Not to measure anything else, just to balance these two so that there is the galvanometer is not reading anything. So the currents don't matter. The EMF does not matter. It doesn't matter what kind of battery you bring in there. So it's not gonna matter. So at the end, when you divide, you're gonna find N plus M over N is equal to, because the I1 and I1 cancel, and P plus X over P is basically an identity. So obviously N plus divided by N is just one, plus M over N is equal to P over P, which is one, plus X over P, and the one cancels the one, and this gives me a condition that M over N is equal to X over P, or exactly what we needed is X equals to PM over N, and that is what we're supposed to show. So as long as you're monitoring the galvanometer and you look at it very carefully and you're tinkering with M and N and P, uh, you're gonna find at some point, the reading is zero. That is the value for X, that is value for the unknown uh, battery. So this is used for measure the batteries with an extreme accuracy, okay? If you know, of course, the other three, that's the deal with it. Okay, so you can gauge all of your batteries. I mean, not batteries, I'm sorry, your, uh, your resistors, what am I talking about? Your resistors. All of this are resistors, P and M, P, M and N, N, P, M, okay? Or M and P, okay? Okay. And then there is an application that if the galvanometer shows zero deflection when M is 850 Newton, N is 15 Newton and P is 33.48, what is the unknown resistance X? So basically it's just a part, second part is just an application of this part. And this is the deal with these problems. And that's another extremely point, important point uh, for your exams, okay, for exams. If you're asked to show something and you struggle to show it, and there is another question that asks you to find something based on it, Find that thing. That's going to give you good credit for the uh, the exam because it's just a numerical application in here. It asks you to show that this is an identity in this case, and you did not know how to do it. But then it comes to the next question. It says if the galvanometer shows a zero deflection when M is equal to 850, and P is 33.48, and N is equal to 15 uh, ohms, then you can just plug the numbers in here and you get credit, at least you didn't lose the entire problem, okay? Read the problems, please. Sometimes you can get credit for doing very little work like this one in here. This part B in here is, is like, a, like a gift, basically. It's a, a freebie, okay? 850 times 33.48 divided by it seems like the like the value of uh, p is the one that we were tinkering with. 1,897.2. I don't know how many sig figs. Four sig figs because the others are probably well-known values. So uh, 1,897 ohms. Okay. Does the second point of discussion make sense to you guys? In a sense that, watch for the free giveaways, for free gifts, like this ones, when you're solving problems. If you're asked to show something, 
and then at the end use it, and you're struggling to show it, just use the thing, finish the problem, and then come back and think of the solution for the rest. Good? Okay, very good. So please, this is trick is true for all kinds of, not just for physics, by the way. It's always when you're doing chemistry, when you're doing uh, math also, when you're asked to show something and then at the end use it so you can show it, just don't waste too much time on it. I mean, take probably the head there and try to come up and make up for it later on, but at least you get something done from that problem. Okay, problem 60. How are we doing on time? Oh, I managed to have 10 minutes. Okay, problem 60. What must the EMF epsilon in this circuit in order for the current through the 7 ohm resistor to be 1.8 amp? Each EMF source has negligible internal resistance. Okay, so we're assuming the directions are correct. So let me draw the graph in here quickly here. So again, you see what I'm headed with this thing in here. So definitely you have to worry about problems where you're going to check on EMFs, okay, on batteries. So there is a 24 volt battery. There is a three ohm resistor. And there is an EMF in here pointing this way. And there is a two ohm resistor here. And there is a seven ohm resistor in here. We know the current through it is 1.8 amps. They didn't tell us which direction that current is flowing, okay? And we need to find this EMF, which we don't know its value. Here is the deal. This battery pushes current this way. This battery pushes current this way. So they must, the current in here must be somehow moving this way. So if I call this one point A and this point B again, the voltage is actually dropping from this way. So the voltage drop across that resistor, VA minus VB is actually seven times 1.8 amps. So seven times 1.8, which was 12.6 volts. So that's how much voltage drop is actually there. Okay, now, uh, we need to find this EMF. So first of all, if I, if I can find this current, which I'm gonna call I3, the reason why I'm calling it I3 is because it's going through this three, uh, three ohm resistor. If I can find I3, and I know there is 1.8 amp in here. Then, uh, obviously it's a bit negative. That means it's flowing in the opposite direction. That's all, okay? That means this battery is too big for this one and that's fine, it could be, okay? So if I can find I3, then I'm going to say I3 plus this current is equal to 1.8 amps. So I can find what this current is. And if I can find what this current is, since I know what the voltage drop is in here, I know what the voltage drop across the two ohms is gonna be then, if I can find what I2 is. I can say that I2 plus I3 then must be equal to 1.8 amps, but I don't know what this current is and I don't know what the other one is. So let's find it. Let's take this loop in this direction because I like this, the way this current is flowing and I like the way the other current is flowing. So that's why I'm going clockwise. And again, I'm gonna go starting from this point and come back to it. So zero is equal to, zero is equal to. I'm rising in potential, therefore I'm dropping by negative 24 volts. Okay, I don't encounter anything in this outer loop until I hit this seven ohm volt, this seven ohm, uh, sorry, uh, resistor. So it's seven ohms times 1.8 amps. That's given. And I know the direction because the two batteries are pointing and that uh, they have that polarity in there. So this is 1.8 volts. I know I calculated this one to be 12.6 volts actually. 
They didn't ask us, but we're calculating it. So this number is equal to 12.6. And then I come back through this resistor, and this resistor is 3 times I3. Obviously, I3 will turn out to be positive. I3 will be just 24 minus 12.6 divided by 3. OK? I3 will be equal to 24 minus 12.6 divided by 3. And that's going to give me a current that is equal to, how much is it? 24 minus 12.6. Man, I should have closed the parentheses in here. It's going to be a big current, by the way. Divided by three. And that is 3.8 amps. So here is the story. I3 is too big, 3.8. That means I2 is 1.8 minus 3.8. It's a negative 2 amps. So I2 then from that algebra, because I2 plus I3 from conservation of charge is 1.8. I2 plus I3, I mean I3 plus I2 in this junction must be equal to 1.8 amps. So that means that this number, I2 will be equal to 1.8 minus 3.8, and this is negative 2 amps. So that means the current is flowing in the opposite direction in here than what I was thinking. It's actually not moving in this direction, but rather it's moving in this direction of two amps. So now I'm in a position to find what this EMF is. So VA minus VB, so VA minus VB, which is I already calculated to be 12.6 volts. So this is 12.6 volts is equal to the voltage drop across this resistor, which is just the EMF, E, because I come coming from the positive to the negative, so this is an actual voltage drop. Plus the voltage drop. Now I'm actually moving in the same direction as the current, which is 2 amps. So it's plus 2, actually, times the resistor. And the resistor is actually 2 ohms either, 2. So both of them are 2 times 2. So this voltage drop is actually 4 volts across the, uh, the resistor. And this is 12.6 volts. So this uh, battery has a drop of 12.6 minus 4, which is 8.6 volts. OK, so this is an 8.6 volt. And it's trying to push a current in here. But this is 24 volts. And it's pushing far more current than what is led to be in here. Okay. So it's pushing 3.8 amps. So part of it, 2 amps, is going through this 2 resist two ohm resistor. Because of the fact I have a 7 ohm in there, that's why I really, uh, have a less current going through there. And it still gives me the whole circuit in here. Okay. So the polarity is here is fixed, is known. And that's why we didn't tinker with it. Actually, if we, this number came out to be negative, then we say, hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong in here. You can't really have it polarized this way. But it turns out to be positive. So the polarity is correct. And uh, the voltage is correct. 8.6 volts is exactly what needs to be done to fix this, this whole drop of 12.6 volts between A and B. Okay. So this is problem six. Does this problem make sense to you guys? Yes, no. OK, you guys have to go through all of these problems again, OK? So there is no way out of this. You cannot really. So the problems we did are problem 19, problem 29, problem 30, problem 31, problem 32, problem 38, problem 47, problem 60, and problem 74. We did nine problems together from this uh, chapter, OK? Are you guys good, or should we spend the entire semester on chapter 26? OK. <laughs> OK, I don't understand if this is good on this chapter, or should we stay with the chapter 26 for the entire semester? <laughs> OK, 
So here is, we still have one minute and this session is gonna be over. So on uh, Wednesday, when we meet, we're gonna introduce chapter 20, uh, 27 as promised. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have uh, uh, the lab and believe me, the lab will have implications on your exam too, because it will help you prepare the exam because you will have a better understanding on, of all of these things together. And uh, I'm hoping to see you then on Wednesday where we go in detail about the lab in the afternoon and also have fun with magnetism, introduce magnetic field, which is the other side of the story from this chapter. Okay. I know time is up it's, and uh, I will see you guys Wednesday. So let me stop the recording first.